this will be dry run uh, number one. Here we go. Oops. Good day. My name is Jason Hand, and in this talk, uh, which is titled Deployment Practices for Greater Reliability, we're going to examine methods for deploying software and infrastructure using modern DevOps practices that result in more reliable systems. Now, many of the things that we're going to be discussing today are foundational concepts around incident management or actually deploying and, and building, which are foundations to building reliable systems. And if you attended the Ops 10 session uh, or 20 or 30, you'll recall the Dickerson hierarchy of reliability. For those of you who weren't or uh, don't recall that, we'll take a few moments to understand our objectives here. First of all, we're trying to build very uh, robust, robust monitoring systems to allow us to have confidence uh, in, in what's going on with our tooling and our practices. We should be able to ask our monitoring systems just about anything and have I feel like we, we're getting a, you know, good information back as well as being alerted to something when things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And when that alert takes place, um, there must be some sort of response, a coordinated effort for the engineers to deal with the issue, to understand what's going on, do something about that. Then we get to learn from those incidents in a post-incident review. And then that takes us to where we are next is our testing and releasing phase, uh, where we really focus on how we can improve reliability just through how we deploy our software. Now, over the next 45 minutes, we're going to be define we're going to define deployments and take a couple take a look at a couple of deployment scenarios. One kind of an old school, and the other using a little bit more modern deployment practices. Um, so we will then dig into some of these modern practices, specifically um, continuous delivery. Uh, next, we're going to check out Azure Pipelines, a tool that we can use to. Uh, to help us adopt modern deployment practices. And we'll close out the demo with a demo on integrating tests into our Azure continuous integration pipelines. Okay, so let's get started with the definition uh, of software deployment. So what exactly is software deployment? I've taken this definition from uh, Wikipedia and where they define software deployment as all of the activities that make software systems available for us to use. And this can include everything between racking and stacking a server to deploying an updated piece of software onto that server. You may already have engaged in deployment using things like scripts or infrastructure as code or even walking around an office with a USB drive installing software. These are all valid deployment activities. Another important point that I want to ensure is clear today is we are not just talking about software deployment, but cloud infrastructure as well. At some point in this talk, I may refer to deploying as services or solution. This to me is speaking to in general terms about deploying software, cloud infrastructure, configuration, and all of the things that's needed to make software systems available for use. Now that we have normalized what deployment means for this conversation, let's look at some typical deployment scenarios. The one that I like to talk about the most and point out is what's called, in many cases, the epic deployment. Now, um, the epic deployment title comes from Jez Humble's continuous delivery reliable software releases through build, test, and deployment automation. It's a fantastic book. You should go check that out when you have a chance. And while the name epic deployment sounds exciting, in this context, this isn't really a good thing. So let's paint a picture of what an epic deployment looks like at Tailwind Traders. I'm sure for a lot of you, this sounds very familiar. Tailwind develops a sales related application. And this application is updated approximately at this, at this point in, in time, just two times a year. Now during these updates, all of the new features, all bug fixes, both large and small, as well as dependency updates are all deployed together. So the year's first deployment is scheduled over Labor Day weekend and the second, the weekend after Thanksgiving. And in, in these situations, they're an all hands on deck situation where everyone, even people from our support and our QA teams are all involved. Services temporarily go offline while the deployment is in progress. And then history has shown that the deployment is really fraught with issues on demand engineering. People really have to like think on their toes, uh, think on their feet and, and really scramble to fix problems that you know happen inevitably every time and configuration management changes. 
And seldom do these deployments really just go as smooth as we want them to. And then once it's complete, it generally feels patched together in some sort of unreproducible way. Uh, this is not a good deployment situation, but I, I bet this sounds familiar for a lot of you. Now, not only is the Epic deployment an intense manual task, it's slow and it's unreproducible due to the complex steps and documentation and quite often requires a few individual experts to even complete the deployment at all. Um, what I'm here to hopefully tell you today is that we can and should do much better than this. Now instead, imagine a world where deployments happen often, monthly, daily, even hourly. Rather than being scheduled far in advance, deployments happen on demand as code is committed. And then this code can be software, infrastructure, or even things like identity as code configurations. We would then have integrated testing to not only the code, but also to provide quick feedback on the results of those tests. It's this quick feedback that allows us to iterate and recover from failed tests a lot quicker. And once our code has been tested, maybe we want to test that deployment end to end in a series of staged environments such as a test or QA, etc. Wouldn't it be great if rolling our deployments through these environments was an integrated part of the deployment experience? And what about a historical record of deployment activities? Not only do I want these records, I want to be able to reconcile my production environment to, at any given time. What I mean by this is I want to be able to understand which deployment created my current production environment. With this knowledge, I trace things back like configurations, test results, uh, the code itself, all the way back to the individual pull request that triggered the deployment. And I can find this option for deployment way more enticing than an, ep than an epic deployment. So now that we have defined deployment and compared two deployment strategies, let's define some goals that we can achieve by using DevOps practices for deploying software solutions. The first goal is we want to reduce the stress involved with deploying services while increasing, while increasing the reliability of those services. This is a great goal. It's a total win-win. Not only were we increasing job satisfaction by reducing the stress involved with software and infra infrastructure deployments, we're also increasing job satisfaction by making our systems more reliable. And this also has a positive impact on the customer experience. So technically, this is a win-win-win. Then we've got goal two where we want to reduce the time between when you know a change is required and when that change is actually deployed into production. For instance, let's assume that you have identified a revenue impacting code defect. You know exactly what the issue is and how to code up the fix. How long does it take you for you to get that code into production? And how many strings do you need to pull? How do you do the testing and how do you do all the pre-flight and all that? Wouldn't it be great if you could code commit Go take lunch, and before returning back to your desk, get a notification that the issue has been resolved. And then goal three, we want to reduce the time between having an idea and delivering usable software. This is very similar to the last goal. However, where instead of impl implementing change, we're, we're talking about pure innovation. How long does it take for you to act on innovation? Wouldn't it be great if you could integrate a new concept into a production system and have the confidence that the added innovation will not break or hinder the current system in any way? With this confidence, you can then quickly deliver the new feature. Fortunately, continuous delivery and the goals put forth on the last slide are not just theory, they are proven. This slide contains some of the data that are taken from the 2019 State of DevOps report from the DevOps Research and Assessment Group. These are real numbers, and so let's take a look. We can see that things are an increase. We can see things like an increase in deployment frequency and time between commit and deployment. But also check out the numbers on the on the bottom row. We've got seven times lower change failure rate and over 2,600 times faster incident recovery. DevOps is huge and perhaps key to running the most reliable systems possible. A software development practice. Um, first of all, let's go through our different ideas between uh, continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery. When we're talking about continuous integration, um, what we mean is a software development practice where team members frequently integrate their own code into a shared repository, sometimes referred to as the trunk. Uh, this is also where our test automation and our build will occur. Next, we've got continuous deployment. 
Producing software in short cycles such that it can be reliably re released using automation. That's when we get to this point where we've reached continuous deployment, where we can actually do this. We can do these things in short cycles in an automated way. And then that takes us into continuous delivery, where the combination of these uh, continuous integration plus the continuous deployment gives us this continuous delivery system. Now, when we talk about some of the things that we need, we want to do in this continuous delivery system, it, a big part of that is test automation, especially when it comes to building reliable systems. And some of the things that we want to be able to test or the, some of the things that we can test on is your basic unit test. We can do simple integration tests. We can also do UI testing. Some of the other things that we can, we can uh, automate in our test automation is we can check out, uh, look into some of the integrations just within our pipeline itself. We can also look through all of the source code and make sure that that, um, that integration is working correctly. We can also test out some of the flexibility in, a, in our framework. And we can add any kind of dashboarding, whatever we think is going to be helpful for us in, in terms of creating visibility. All these things can, can be tested with some sort of automation because these are things that we want to make sure are you know, up to our standards. Now here's a simple example of what a delivery or a deployment pipeline might look like. And while it is overly simplified, there are a few things to point out that will be helpful when building more complex pipelines. An instance of the pipeline starts as a code or infrastructure change and is committed as to a code repository. Perhaps a pull request is used. Next, a unit test runs, perhaps integration or end-to-end -end tests, and ideally the results of these tests are communicated back to the requesting party. Perhaps the code in the repository is scanned for secrets, vulnerabilities, and aspects of configuration. And when everything checks out, the code is built and prepared for deployment. Next, the code is deployed to a test environment. A human gets notified of the new deployment and perhaps gives the pre-production solution a look. This human can then approve or deny the deployment for production, which starts the deployment process. We can then see that in this pipeline with the delineation between integration and uh, deployments. We can also see some logical places where we can stop the pipeline through, though included logic and automation, or through included logic and automation, uh, or potentially even human intervention. Now, I'm going to show you in a few moments how we can do some of this using um, one feature within Azure DevOps, which is called Azure Pipeline. So we'll be talking about DevOps practices, but to demonstrate that, I'm going to have to use those principles we'll be using Azure Pipelines or our own CI CD platform. So let's go ahead and um, hop out. our demo environment. Okay, so the first thing that we want to demonstrate is that um, we've got this ability to integrate in all of our testing into our pipelines. And I can integrate um, my code in my repository so that all of these tests will just kick off anytime that there is some sort of pull request, some sort of pull request. So I've got this uh, demo, or I've got this new uh, change of code here into my environment here. So I'm just going to do a quick pull request, and we'll take a look and see what happens. So I need to make sure I'm putting this into my right um, master trunk here. Uh, we're going to be using the branch that has uh, sent this to, committed this to. <laughs> okay. So some of the things that we're going to start talking about now in the demo is related specifically more to the Azure pipelines and, how, and some of the tests. Now, what I want to just sort of pause and show you here is how just by committing code, just by doing a simple um, pull request, I haven't even merged anything yet, but just a pull request, we've already got some testing that has been kicked off. And that's simply just by integrating in Azure pipelines with this particular um, with this particular repo. So anytime that I've got a new pull request in here, I've got some tests that will automatically kick off. So it's really cool to be able to, uh, in just a, you know, a few small steps, be able to integrate these things together so that you can actually start doing some really important testing before you even get into not only the merging step, but the building step and, and sort of the other additional steps within our pipeline. 
Uh, so we can see we've got some things going on here, some checks that are still in progress. And, um, you know, one thing I wanted to show you actually before we get too far is this whole application that we're talking about um, and that we're going to be re re sort of deploying and going through the pipeline is Tailwind Traders. And it's their front end application um, has got an issue with their shopping cart. So if we if you happen to be in Ops 20 and even Ops 30, you've probably you're familiar with this broken shopping cart thing. And so what we're doing now is we want to you know we've we've already discovered our our fix, although we do still need to fix something here. But the safer way, the more reliable way to fix these things rather than going into production and getting our hands in there is to actually code up the fix and then just redeploy. And, and hopefully that, you know, will we'll take care of the issues. And that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. So um, if I were to come back here, you can see all the checks have passed. Um, but anyway, this is the this is the front end in the shopping cart. We can see that we've got an issue. So we want to we want to, you know, not only fix this, but but also put in some testing that will hopefully prevent this specific type of problem happening again in the future. So we've learned from our mistakes. We've learned from our problems through our, our post incident reviews. And this is some of the things that we've come up with this is we want to add this uh, as sort of an action item to uh, pretty much how we do you know, a lot of our development moving forward. So um, we can see everything's p passed here. Now I'm going to go ahead and merge this pull request. And while that's taking place, um, let's head over into Azure Pipelines. Now, um, if I'm in here, my overview, um, if you've not been into Azure Pipelines before, it's, there's a lot of different things we can, we can do within Azure Pipelines or within Azure DevOps. We've got boards and repos and, and different things, but we're just talking about pipelines. So if I come into Pipeline, I've already got one that's run, uh, that's been set up here, and you can see it's already, it's already picked up the change and the merge actually, um, but had we even come in here before we merged it, we would have seen that it would have kicked off the process simply from the pull request. But we went ahead and merged it, and we can see, um, you know, this has already been merged into our main branch, into master. Last commit was a minute ago. And what's taking place is it's going through all of the different jobs and tasks within each of these stages. And we've got all these different stages that are um, here that represent the, the different um, parts of the pipeline. So right now it's going through our test stage and we've got a number of different tests that we can go and kind of look to see what's happening. Um, <clears throat> and right, you can see here pretty easily just by looking at it, one, one of the first couple steps that it's doing is it's installing Pester. After it's got, of course, its, um, its own little agent running here, the agents are just simply VMs with you know containers so that they can go out and kind of take care of the the tasks that need to be done in order to run these tests. And here we can see all the tests have been um, completed and they've all passed. We've also um, now we can see that it's moved on to the next step, which is starting to go through. And if we were to click in to see each of these, we can see the first step it's going through is is uh, you know part the another task within the stage that is actually using some aspects of Kubernetes to go out and package everything up, put them in containers, put them in container registries um, using, you know, Docker. Um, so that's the steps that's really kind of happening in terms of really building and, and just packaging up our application so it's ready to go. And then once it completes that, then it's going to go ahead and deploy to our um, release uh, our, sorry, our pre-production environment. And then from here, we should see some, we should see a stop. And so from this point, I kind of want to, I kind of want to uh, take a little time to explain what's going on. And so I'm going to hop over and we're going to take just a look at the YAML aspect of this exact same deployment pipeline. So uh, if we, if we look, oh, we got test, build, and then pre-production and then production. If we're looking, this is our YAML um, representation of the exact same thing. And I'm going to just uh, reduce all these down here, kind of shrink them down so we can see it at a little bit higher level. And I'll go through it uh, one by one. Now, at the top of this YAML, um, there's a couple of things I want to point out, first of all, is that this, this particular run, this pipeline run, will trigger any time that there is a, um, this is only just looking at things on master. 
Okay, so when I um, merged into the master branch, that's what triggered this pipeline. And then the second part of this YAML file is that it will do it also on PRs to master. So I had mentioned earlier that if we had got in there fast enough, we would have seen it from just my PR. Um, that wouldn't have actually ten been true because it, I had done a PR against the branch rather than against master. So if this had my, um, uh, my uh, other branch, not the master branch on there, it would have kicked things off. So that's what happens here in these first two steps. Now, if we take a look at variables, um, variables are pretty self-explanatory, but they're really just the, um, uh, the different aspects of, of the system that we're gonna use throughout this particular YAML file. So we know we're gonna recall the Azure subscription, uh, the container registry, the, all these different um, things, including our connection um, uh, string here, our connection host address for our database, because this is what we want to start putting a test in for. Um, like I mentioned, we we found out in some of the previous talks that we had an issue talking to our the right database. So now when we do a deployment, we want to double check that we are actually talking to the right database. So we're, we're using that as a variable here so that we can populate other parts of the YAML file later on. So that's everything that's taking place in uh, here within the variables. Now, one thing you could do for some of these things, obviously they're a little bit sensitive um, or, or could potentially be seen as sensitive um, bits of information, or maybe you just don't want them part of your YAML file, YAML file per se. What you can do is over here under the library, um, you can go ahead and, and set up a way, a method for you to store your secrets. You can even connect it to your key vault, and that way you can just pass through any, any um, you know, any kind of login information, any kind of, you know, any any information at all that you think is is something you want to keep secret. Um, so you can you can manage things that way. But just for the sake of this demo, we've got it laid out here to to show you what you can do with variables. Then we get into our stages portion of the YAML. And we've got four different stages in which, if you recall, we've got four stages over here. Um, so that's a way for you to sort of visualize what's, the, what's going on and how those match up. And there, our first one is test and build. And so they go in order here. And if I expand each one out, and we'll kind of go through what's going on. When we start off our test, um, our, our test stage, before it can do anything, it has to kick off a job that's going to um, provision us uh, an agent. Um, and in this case, we've chosen to use uh, Ubuntu 16.04. We've also set our continue on air to false, as well as our timeouts. All of that, of course, is adjustable to your own needs. You can be um, spinning up literally any operating system that you want, including Windows and, of course, you know, as you can see, Linux and Mac. Um, we just happen to be using your basic Ubuntu here. And then, so once we've got our agent and we've got our environment here, our little, um, you know, agent to, to run our tasks. The next things we want to do, the next thing I'm doing in this particular test is installing um, this little uh, PowerShell thing called, in, uh, called Pester. And so that's just something we'll, we, we're going to install here. Um, the next thing we're going to use is this um, another just Azure CLI command that helps us generate a file that we are all, um, if you look through here, just generates a file into our SQL uh, our, uh, from our SQL database and uh, creates a YAML file as well as uh, a couple other things here. So we've got that part. And then, then the next one is it's going to just really just parse through some of that content it just, it just grabbed and then run our pester tests um, after we've you know, we installed pester just a little bit ago and then publish the results of all that into an XML file so that we can go back and, and review that and have that ready to go. So those are the first couple of ste uh, steps or jobs within um, our within our um, our testing stage. Then we can go down into build, and here we can see kind of a, a similar setup here where we go ahead and create our agent. Same thing with ho hosted Ubuntu, and then we've got a few other things that we go through here, including getting a Helm uh, fired up and uh, packaging up everything so that we can then publish that into our container registry. So that's you know. We've already kind of talked about it over here, but this is just a way for you to to um, manage your your deployment pipeline 
in a way that you can use it in source control. So, um, you know, YAML is kind of like the, the sort of the now, I think the decided upon future in, in terms of how we do infrastructure uh, for a lot of different services and tools. And um, one big reason is that we can source control that now, which means we can create really reproducible and, and, and traceable uh, infrastructure and applications, which is really essential to building a res resilient and reliable system. Um, so those are the things that I wanted to show you there. Um, we can come back in here. We can see now everything's gone through all of the stages. And we can even um, look into every one of the little uh, sub steps within each one and check out the logs for every single thing that's going on in here. And you can see that it's actually stopped here in between um, our pre-production environment and our production environment. And that's because we set it up to uh, require if we go back into the uh, design here, um, we set it up to require that um, in order to get to the final stage, it needs a few things. So one thing I, I, I failed to point out, but I should, I'm should i going to go ahead now, is that if we look at our different stages, our first test stage, it, it has a dependency here, but it doesn't depend on anything, which means that it's going to go ahead and kick off that test no matter what. If it's a PR to the master environment, or master uh, re repository, it's going to trigger this and it doesn't need anything to, to stop it. So it's just going to go ahead and run the test, which is what we want. But if we look at the next stage in the build, it depends on test. So build won't go until test has run successfully, which is what we want. But we also need that, that the build reason, it can't be a pull request. So what that does is it sets it up so that pull requests will be will get tested all day long. It's always going to run through those tests, which is good. We want that. Why not go ahead and, and test them every time we do a you know do a pull request? Um, might as well get that fast feedback. But we um, don't want to go ahead and build every single time. That's a little bit of a, a you know just that doesn't provide any value. So rather than doing a um, rather than moving on to the build from just a simple pull request, it has to be merged in. So that's what kind of allows us to move into this building stage, okay? So those are our conditions and, and what they depend on. Now, if you look here, this pre-production one, it only just requires that the build has completed successfully, which is gonna, you know, hopefully, you know, take place every time. But once we get to production, this pre-production one, you know, relies on this to be done, this to be completed. But one of the other things that we set up within uh, within our um, within our pipeline here is if we go into edit pipeline and then. under our well um, somewhere you can choose set it up so that it requires a sign off requires a review uh, but for some reason I'm having a hard time finding that right now but um, there's a place for you to go in and, and put who can be, uh, who, who's an approver essentially. And so what it's set up is it not only has to get into the pre-production uh, successfully, but then there's also needs to be a person who has to get involved in this particular, the way we've got this all set up. And that's exactly what's happening over here. If I just get back into uh, the pipeline. Oh, let me just check something right here. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, and so I can now just come in here and review this and hit approve. And what will happen is it will deploy out to our um, environment. And so that's really just kind of the, the main things I want to show you. You can, you can also come in here and check out tests. Uh, of course, anything that's failed, it's going to show you a summary about all those. You can come in here and, and uh, add some different things to change the filters different things that you'd like to see if there was any kind of a stack trace from the error, that type of stuff. Um, oh, here it is. 
So under our environments, I've got it set up for production uh, requires, if you go into view environment, approvals and checks. Uh, oops, I'm in pre-production. Pre-production, uh, approvals and checks. This is where I've got um, all approvers must approve. It's got um, it's got just myself in there, but that's where we've got it set up to uh, it needs a review to move on past that next stage. And you can see here in production something is happening, and that is our our deployment. And it is <clears throat> down to the final steps here. All right, so let's go back to our presentation. All right. So uh, we talked a little bit about Azure Pipelines, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, and how we can kind of um, you know, set all that up, not only in sort of the, you can see all the things in the visual, uh, visual uh, method, which is nice visually to look at, but we created it all using a YAML file, um, which has got a ton of flexibility, uh, which, but the biggest win is that it's done using source control. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about deployments, uh, what continuous deployments are, why they're important to reliability, how they help with reliability, um, but there's a lot of other things that we need to kind of cover as well. And I think one aspect that we want to talk about is different deployment strategies. And there's a number of, uh, I would say, popular ones that I want to just sort of uh, review for you. The first one being the rolling deployments or rolling upgrades. And what we're doing here is we've, we're introducing slow, it's a slow introduction uh, of new, of a new version of code gradually increasing in instances while decreasing the instances of the old stuff. And so um, you just, you know, when you're using a lot of different, uh, you know, say VMs or just different instances in general, uh, of whatever it may be, maybe they're containers, we just sort of add more and decrease, add more of the good and decrease, or add more of the new and decrease some of the old. And the benefit here is that the ability to stop that role and revert to the old um, and another important aspect here is that we also, uh, we, we need to be able to monitor the health, no matter what we do really in all of these, we need to be able to monitor what our deployments are doing. And the next one I wanna point out is the blue-green deployment. Um, in these, we deploy the updated code into a separate environment, completely separate environment. We're not adding new uh, servers into the same environment with just new code. This is a whole new environment. And we're gonna monitor that environment, monitor all that stuff for stability and then cut over uh, the new environment whenever we're satisfied. So we, we're essentially gonna have two things running at the same time, um, sending you know, direct, uh, traffic to one, and as soon as we're happy based on monitoring and whatever metrics and that kind of thing, uh, we will do a switch. And then we also wanna talk about canary de deployments. These were deploying a new version in production while gradually shifting traffic to that new version. So kind of like A-B pe B testing to a certain degree. And really, you know, th they're not, none of these are super dramatically different than the, than the others. But in this case with canary, we're just gonna start shifting traffic um, over. And if we see a problem, we can shift traffic back and then, you know, maybe un unwind from there. Something else we want to talk about, although not necessarily a deployment strategy, are feature flags where the code already, uh, maybe some for new feature or some change, already exists in production, but it's hidden behind some sort of flag that might be something in a database um, that once changed, once that value changes within the database per se, um, it then enables some aspect of code or some section of code or microservice or feature or whatever it may be within, within the system. So feature flags, although not a deployment strategy, something I think worth noting and worth looking more into if that's you know, something that sounds interesting to you. Something else I think uh, we want to talk about, um, especially just you know because we're going to be showing a little bit of Kubernetes and, and that's what the Tailwind Traders site's based on, is the canary deployment for Kubernetes. So um, within Kubernetes, within AKS, the, the services that, that we offer within Azure, Azure Kubernetes services, there's also app services and then Azure pipelines and all of them have some different deployment strategies already kind of baked in. So <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about them. App services, blue, green, and canary deployment strategies are already kind of uh, templated out or, or ready for you to just do it that way if you're using app services. If you're using AKS, uh, the idea of rolling updates is already kind of baked into the product as well. And then Azure Pipelines has both Canary, or I'm sorry, has Canary to Kubernetes, um, which is actually a really new thing. 
I think it came out just this past year in, in September at Ignite, where essentially um, within our YAML file, we can just point out that we're using Kubernetes. We want to change, uh, specify the strategy of Canary. And what we're saying here is that uh, we want to set the, the traffic uh, to be 25% um, as far as what, what kind of how, how we're going to shift over the traffic. So just something to look, to watch out for and look into maybe more if that's the way you're um, building things out. Now, the other thing I want to point out that I think is, is extremely important when it comes to building reliable systems in, in terms of all this deployment stuff is the, the, the ability to trace what's going on within our environment. Anytime there's a deployment and something goes wrong, it's always important to see what we can learn from that. That's why the, the idea of post-incident reviews are important, but we need to be able to have some way of tracing back what took place, what changed. Change is really kind of the only thing that's ever the problem with our systems, but also change is the thing that we have to do constantly to improve it. Um, but we need to be able to, you know, through quick feedback, shortened feedback, be able to respond quickly and change things quickly and, and improve quickly. Well, you can't have shortened feedback. You can't respond quickly or do any of that if you're not tracking things, if you're not, if there's no traceability for anything. So we want to be able to create ties back into what's happening um, within our systems, including our, depo our deployment. So we want to be able to correlate production to specific build instances. We'd like to be able to trace uh, our builds back to um, certain pull requests and, and code changes, like specific ones, which builds were tied back to that. And this is all a byproduct of, of the pipeline, um, you know, and how we're, we've got everything kind of controlled through our, our continuous deployment. And like I mentioned, this is all super useful in a post-incident review. So let's switch over and I want to show you another thing that's kind of cool in terms of being able to trace uh, <clears throat> certain deployments back to the actual pull request within GitHub. And so we can, we can kind of real quickly um, drill in and, and do some sleuthing to figure out, okay, so a deployment just went out, let's say something went wrong, we can, we can see which, which code actually, which lines of code specifically caused uh, or were at least a contributing factor to some sort of a problem that we're experiencing. So let's switch over to our browser again. Now you can see uh, just for um, while we're on the screen that everything has gone green. We've released out into production. And uh, I'm wondering if I come into my shopping cart, I think this is because I'm in the uh, wrong environment maybe. Um, but everything is deployed out. And uh, actually I'm not even sure I, I have like a fix for when I deployed out, so. Um, but what we can do now is I can come in here and from within uh, my pipeline, I can go straight into these commits and I can see, um, I want to look at something. And or actually, before I do that, I want to show you something real quick here because from within this screen here, if you look up in the top, there's lots of different ways you can find the ID for the build ID. And we're going to need that um, uh, in order to sort of trace things back. And <clears throat> uh, for me, you know, because I'm usually on this screen the most, this one or this one, the quickest way is from this screen is to just come up and grab the build ID from, from here. So it's 19, I'm just gonna keep that in mind. Um, but from, with, from within here, I can go in and um, I'm gonna show you by, by just a few clicks, we can get into, I can take me right to some of the changes that took place here. So this is just the readme file. Um, but if I was to, let's say, be investigating a problem and I didn't necessarily know um, where to you know where to start looking what the build ID may have been um, if I'm over in uh, if in Azure portals here I'm in the container registry so this is part of our AKS where we packaged everything up and we we build these artifacts and every artifact is uh, in it contains a uh, if you look in within the build steps what we're doing is we're creating, um, when we create different aspects of our system, what we're using is the build ID, which is just, um, <clears throat> it's just a, um, a variable within the system, it's just a native variable within the system that helps us actually associate a version number as well as uh, we use it to create um, a few other aspects within the container registry. So when I come into my container registry, okay, this is the one associated with our application here, and I look into my repositories, I'll see that I've got cart API. 
And here I can see build ID 19, which is matching up with the one that I just had. So I, if I was, uh, let's say, trying to dig into things and I, and I noticed um, that something was going on and I came back into here to see what the most recent one was, um, I can see it's 19. I can even see out the manifest. But <clears throat> what's more important is that I can trace all this back. Okay, so that's one easy way. Now, another thing, another way we can do this is actually by uh, from within from our production environment is we can use a couple commands here to to look at something. And we should be able to see in here, if we scroll down, we can see right here the API, the cart API 19, which if you recall, this is exactly where this is being created here. So what we're doing is we're creating um, a way to tie things back and we can see that both in our production environment, if we were just gonna you know, give us a little um, uh, information about that actual pod that we're running here, um, that's running in production, the one that we most recently pushed out, it is this deployment here. And I can see, I can go all the way back. And if I were in 19, if I wanted to just go to um, current, I mean, I can switch this right here actually to 18. But let's say I knew it's 19 now. I'll go to the most uh, recent commit here and see the actual line of code that went out with that deployment. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you there. Let's go back to our slides and wrap things up. With just a few minutes that we have left. Um, so we looked at pipelines a little bit more and the integrated testing, or no, that's not true. We looked at traceability, so those notes are wrong. Now, uh, in summary, just sort of the, talking about the modern deployment practices here. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're building more reliability into our systems. So we're improving the reliability of our systems, which a lot of this, you, you know, you can see is just done through some really basic techniques. Um, we've already kind of focused on the monitoring and the incident management and, and how we can learn how to improve our systems. But now we're going to put some things into actual, uh, actual, you know, uh, work. And, and so we're always after ways to improve our system, but we need continuous feedback. We need fast feedback, and that includes our, de our delivery process. So we want to create this continuous delivery situation. Um, and a lot of that, um, you know, you, is going to require uh, some strong test automation and some just sort of some real discipline around what you test and how you're testing it. And, and you can see it's not that difficult to integrate in your repositories so that all it takes is just a pull request for things to automatically start testing. Think of how much time that saves um, so many people just by um, getting that, that sense of comfort that their code has already been tested the moment that a pull request goes in. And all of these things we've talked about, these we saw the numbers on it. These are the way that uh, you know, really modern thinking companies and, and sort of the, the four thought leaders in, in, in our industry are doing things. These are modern deployment strategies. It really isn't uh, a situation where we need to be doing things like we talked about with the Epic deployment. That's that's not sustainable. Those just There's just a better way. There's something we got to take advantage of. And speaking of take advantage of, um, you know, there's so many different things that just become the byproduct of, of moving to these CI CD byproducts and, and continuous delivery systems where you have more reliable in reliability in the system is just the byproduct of having CI CD uh, in place. So hopefully that covers, I know a lot of different things, but um, some high level ideas that you can take home and think about um, as well as maybe go and implement into some of your pipelines and you can get some of your, um, some of your aspects of your system, you know, set up so you can do, do these automated testing and all kinds of really fun stuff uh, with nothing more than, as you saw, a little bit of YAML. So uh, some resources, um, everything that we talked about today is all available, including the, the system. You can deploy the whole Tailwind Trader system uh, and have, you know, go crazy with all that. Here's the links to, to download um, everything you'll need to get up and running with all that stuff. We also have some docs that you want, if you probably want to check out if you're interested in learning more about Azure Pipelines. As you can see, I had to cover a lot in a very short amount of time. 
We've also got some learn material that uh, I think has been very helpful for me. I encourage you to check that out. We're doing free certification exams here and uh, I encourage you to check that out. And last but not least, we've got one more session coming up with this learning path, which really ties everything together within a reliability in preparing for growth, uh, capacity planning and scale. So with that, I would thank you very much. My name is Jason and it's been a pleasure.